hear me? <laughs> but um, is it on the screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, welcome everyone uh, for the second uh, seminar of the semester. And uh, yeah, as we said earlier, today's guest need no introduction. Uh, Amuna Harrison from the house. <laughs> which will talk today about her <laughs> interdisciplinary project that she has in Iceland with uh, many colleagues. And yeah, I'm sure you hear all the time about it, but uh, for once we get, uh, well at least I get, because I don't know how much you've heard about it, but like a full long presentation is, uh, is well needed. So um, yeah, welcome Pamela and thank you for coming. Thank you Survey and again thanks to you all. Uh, for organizing this, uh, we'll probably get a long uh, talk. Uh, how uh, how sort of pulled together it is, we will just see. Uh, as I said to my uh, colleagues, ask me the difficult questions a little bit later on. Uh, the problem is, uh, this is such a big project with so many different uh, actors that uh, even pulling together the, the one word package that I'm in charge of. Uh, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, also, being the uh, field archaeologist, the zoo archaeologist specialist, and some of the others, and the budget person on my end, as well as uh, one of the PIs, uh, it's a bit challenging. Uh, but I will just try to do my. Maybe you have to click on the screen once with the mouse. Uh, so it's I know. Yeah. So, um, the title is Colorful Icelandic Context Interdisciplinary Tales from the Two Valleys Projects. Uh, this probably makes a bit of sense because this video looks uh, somewhat middle and upland. Uh, this tiny little site here called uh, Hauskot, which is a shearing site. This is not so much uh, a valley uh, view, I would say, uh, but this is the, um, the sort of end of the valley. Um, where the delta uh, uh, happens, where the, the Herga River that you see up there uh, runs off into the fjord, a fjord. So this is where things get together, where uh, materials, at least from the mountains, uh, through debris and uh, through rainfall and snowfall, uh, end up. And uh, where people uh, still meet, but definitely met in the medieval times. Uh, and this is a reenactment uh, date at a uh, medieval trading site at Gaussir that I've been talking about endlessly for the past, uh, I don't know, 20 years, I think. Uh, that's where I started working on uh, archaeofauna, on faunal remains from archaeological sites in Iceland. Um, since then, uh, and that was yeah, 20 years ago, just about exactly, I think. Since then, uh, and I'm also not a map maker, but hey, <laughs> uh, we're talking here, you can see where the river that I just talked about is Harkau, that uh, names one of the valleys, uh, runs off <coughs> or ends into the <coughs> fjord, this very long fjord that made it very easy for, for boats to come in from the open ocean. We get, get relatively deep into the interior of Iceland. We have, of course, Reykjavik here. Um, so what I did was, and I know you've heard about this multiple times, uh, tried to find uh, contemporaneous um, archaeofauna and, and uh, activity settlement sites that would give me a little bit of an idea of what the um, animal bones patterns could look like in an area that forms the, more or less one of the hinterlands uh, regions to a medieval trading site or to a relatively uh, central site. We're talking small scale here. Iceland didn't have an uh, official um, town, which was Reykjavik, until the 17th, 18th century. So we're talking uh, hugely uh, fewer people than we imagine in Norway, for example. Just keep that in mind. We're very, very far away. Uh, we're, we're surprisingly close, in a way, in terms of connections, but we are very far away. Um, so what has happened is that um, Eventually, I sort of branched out, and I wasn't alone. I was just being helped by a lot of people. I had the crazy ideas, and then uh, other people actually helped me put them into place. Uh, or let's say I was one of them with the crazy ideas. Um, what ha ended up having, happening is what you see here, basically. So this is now our collected research area 
in, in this uh, AFLA region. So it's not only this valley system, although we have been uh, investigating this the most, but it's also this one up here, uh, which actually splits off into two. It's called, oh, sorry, called Svarvelavall. Um, and this Siglo nest site, which uh, you've also heard endlessly, and some of you, if you've been in my uh, lectures, uh, probably have uh, seen some of the archaeofauna from that, all the beautiful fish bones. Uh, to some of us, uh, they are very beautiful. Uh, and, and much more recently, uh, as uh, in last year, uh, we started uh, including the very far away Grimsey uh, site or area as well. Because there, uh, our colleagues at the Archaeological Institute in Iceland actually basically rescued an amazing archaeofauna uh, that is now uh, in process of being analyzed, or at least uh, subsampled. And uh, this uh, particular task uh, went to Christine um, Müller Nielsen, who is my PhD candidate. <laughs> and uh, she was happy, but also scared of it. But So we will, we will uh, learn a lot more about all of this. So two valleys is you know, one thing, but we've branched out. So the valley systems and also the coastal areas need to go together because one thing that we're trying to do is also find out what the connections are, not just between the valley systems uh, or the interior of the valley systems themselves, but also how people connect it up to the coastal areas, but also between the different uh, fjord areas, and then ideally also internationally, but I can pack all of this in uh, and, and get through this. And also because I said some colorful uh, or some tales, uh, this is very, this is gonna be a bit more uh, humanities if you like, even though I'm gonna talk quite a bit about environmental uh, approaches to the research, just because uh, the, the story and the research is becoming more and more complex and also informed by more and more uh, sort of actors, if you like, both from the very distant past, but also from the more recent past. Uh, and one of those actors, uh, yeah, but before, sorry, before I go uh, much, much further, last time I was talking here, uh, not in this very room, I think it was Clifton, that was some years ago, um, I think it was 2017, and I ended up with these uh, following three slides. So I had talked about the research in Hörgerdaler, um, which is um, this valley system here. I had talked about these sites quite a bit, very little about Stadartunga site. Uh, but Stadartunga site is actually one of the focal uh, points um, for this very two valleys uh, project. Maybe a bit about seagliness, but uh, the thought was, the hope was, that one could branch out and not just look at one uh, hinterland area, but potentially even another one. Uh, and this idea didn't just um, start with me, this is many of my colleagues who ended up being in the research project with me. Um, one of them, you will see over and over again, is Howell Roberts. Um, you will find out, if you don't know him, you will get to him very shortly. Um, most of us knew him quite well. Um, but the, the point was that uh, me and colleagues would branch out into the next, uh, in the northerly valley system to check out what sort of uh, information we could gather there. Um, one of the reasons that there had been a lot of interest in, in the local population, in, in uh, people doing archaeology there, was because Svarvadadadir, uh, that northerly uh, valley system, um, was home to the former um, president of Iceland, Christian Eljom, who actually had been an archaeologist before he became uh, the president. So that in itself was an accomplishment because somebody from the humanities became president rather than the usual business magnets or, you know. Uh, uh, so, so he has extremely high esteem. Uh, he actually did start a lot of great projects. He was born at the site called Tjork, uh, which is Pond. Um, and he actually was the uncle of this guy right here, which is one of our geologists um, and uh, one of the sweetest people in the world. Um, he doesn't always look like that, but uh, this is just to say that we are all very much interested in each other's um, uh, 
parts of this project. Uh, these uh, two guys are um, Daniel Brun and uh, Brignol uh, Jonsson, who had really done a lot of amazing uh, work in the in the North Atlantic at the sort of turn uh, from the 19th to the 20th century. So a lot of the large excavation sites that you will know maybe know about uh, from Iceland, they had previously been investigated by them when they did their sort of tour across Iceland. So Hostair, um, Skrida Cloister, all those places. Um, and yeah, of course Howell was, was one of the people uh, involved in, in maybe planning. And the other person was, uh, and still is, um, Elin uh, Osk Reidarsdottir. Uh, she was doing a lot of research on boundary walls before we started with this project. Um, and so we, we, we thought we would just do a bit of investigative uh, sort of digging around and start a small research project. I'm not <coughs> sure why, what happened here. Yeah, to also, yeah, that was the point, to sort of connect out this map should come earlier, but to basically add this here, research, to this one as well. So we would have a larger area of investigation. One of the points was also that here, uh, and especially Arne Daniel Juliusson, who is the Icelandic PI, who had a lot of the ideas, had done a lot of uh, working up of the written sources, but there's been almost no uh, excavation of settlement sites done. So there were, uh, we're getting to that. Uh, whereas here, we have been, Howell and I and others, have been doing quite a lot of work uh, in terms of mid archaeology and trying to connect the chronology uh, across a, a larger area, a chronology of activity. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the written sources were destroyed in a fire in the 14th century uh, in the 15th century uh, uh, at Mörevetle, which was a monastic site. And you know what happens at monasteries. They burn down somehow, <laughs> over and over again, right? Yes. Uh, which helps out uh, sometimes uh, with finding sort of, you know, nice chronological markers, but it really doesn't help much more. Um, anyway, so we, we kind of got together, all of us, and started talking about how could we uh, pack what we know about our respective areas in, into a research project that could maybe start addressing some of the questions that some of us might have. Um, we tried several times um, until uh, in 2021 we actually were awarded this uh, research, uh, Icelandic Research Foundation Award uh, or Grant of Excellence. Two valleys project, power, wealth, and plague in two valleys, Svarada Dalar, Hargal Dalar, and the hinterlands. And then circa 80, 870 till 1500. And yes, we packed in everything we possibly could. And yes, it was COVID. But uh, the Black Death is very legit uh, because there is a lot of work that hasn't been done, uh, especially in Iceland. Uh, Black Death uh, happened uh, later, or what we understand as the, the Black Death happened later in Iceland than in many other areas. So rather, uh, it happening in the early 14th century, it uh, really uh, impacted in the early 15th century. So, you know, but we don't know a lot about that area, especially uh, archaeologically, because a lot of the focus had been placed on uh, the Viking Age uh, archaeology, uh, on the settlement uh, history of Iceland. And then a little bit on the uh, very recent history, but sort of the in-betweens, um, they weren't always uh, the focal points. So we tried, we, 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 would just, we thought we would just go into that. Uh, also because Arne Daniel Juliusson is a medieval uh, historian, amongst other things. Uh, but here you see the, the sort of the group. Um, lots of different uh, backgrounds. Uh, we have like, a lot of survey, um, survey background here with Elin Oskredarstotir, but then we have a proper historian who is also interested in digging, who actually uh, allows me to say that if you want to change history, uh, go into archaeology. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, Stefan Olofsson, uh, our great colleague from uh, the Archaeological Institute in Iceland, uh, 
And then we have Axel Christensen, who is a historian, but he's a very theoretical historian. So if you have any questions about but what and why, go and talk to him and also Arne Daniel. Uh, Ed Lallenson is a paleoecologist, so he does, um, amongst other things, uh, palynology, but also just uh, ancient land uh, reconstruction or land cover reconstructions. Um, then we have Arne Jartason, whom you saw before. Uh, he's retired, but he keeps on going. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, Elisabeth Auster Eithorstotter. Uh, she's the paleoecology PhD, and uh, Christy Miller Nielsen, who is, uh, whom most of you know, our slow archaeology PhD. Uh, and we have uh, Jack Hartley, who is sort of not really officially associated, but has been with us and knows a lot about. Uh, our research. So if you ever think that medieval studies, what is it? I'm still trying to figure that out, but it can also be people who know a lot about the sagas and also come digging with us. So, you know, uh, I think he is maybe the one uh, extremely Tverfagli um, person. And then, of course, uh, because uh, when we're lucky, and we actually do find uh, organic uh, remains that we can date mostly, uh, then people are very interested in doing further research uh, because what we do takes a lot of time and effort and uh, that's why you don't see, will not see uh, a very finished uh, you know, presentation of, of all the data because that's still to come, that's the next two years, we just finish our field work. But people are willing to sort of support and help us with very specialized, very expensive analysis that we couldn't really afford. And so, you know, we really like to play with those people. So, uh, see change people, you probably heard me talk, oh yeah, these other people, uh, are a, a fantastically big, uh, you know, such a big project, but uh, we are one of the work packages. This is em Emilia um, Langscher, and she's actually doing uh, her PhD on analyzing sedimentary DNA. So, there, so now we have the whole aspect. Um, and then uh, I just have to mention it, and that's why I, I said um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we, there are some people who work here in, in uh, Bergen at Bergen University now whom I've known uh, for 20 years as well and whom I've worked with. So it was very nice uh, to hear about this fantastically big project, but it was also very nice to hear that. There is quite a bit of uh, bone material, and I cleared it off with them, so they said it was cool that I would show this picture. But they, I was allowed, uh, and Yvonne also allowed me, uh, to come up for a day, and uh, they just showed me how easy it can be uh, to, to get fantastic uh, archaeophone. I know the human skeletal remains are just spectacular, but there is more to it, isn't there? Yeah. More, more from Yvonne later? Not today, maybe, but another time. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, this is just to see, I mean, uh, Howell is no stranger to sieving and uh, digging in mid-ends. Uh, this was an Icelandic project we did together, and now he was showing off uh, here at the uh, Celia. But to go back to the Two Valleys project, the, the, the whole point was we started with one very central question, or so we thought, investigating how a basically egalitarian Icelandic settler society uh, during you know, settlement time, transformed into an increasingly complex class society that was dominated by landowners with tenants subjected to them. That is so very packed, and to, to even uh, start at that question, you would again have to talk to Axel and, and also Arne Daniel, but fair enough, I, I'll take it. Uh, uh, then the aim really was uh, to, to look at sort of three different um, distinct um, periods, which on paper, again, sounds really good, and even putting together uh, an interdisciplinary research package, it takes a lot of work, but it still sounds good on paper. Uh, but then, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about Black Death uh, and archaeology, it becomes very complex. Uh, when you talk about uh, kind of picking up uh, traces of uh, the changes from an egalitarian to a more uh, complex society, uh, it becomes even more complex. So, so we very quickly, oh yeah, and this is Orne Daniel, who is also a punk rock star in Iceland, uh, and this is me. <laughs> uh, it, it sort of, 
it is fantastic. Um, we're learning so much about our respective disciplines, but we are learning about our respective disciplines and where our boundaries are. And so that takes a lot of time. Uh, and these are all people we really, really like and have invited into the project because we know we want to work with each other. And still, sometimes we have to explain in so many different uh, terms what it is we're talking about. And then they tell us, yeah, I thought the same thing, but this way. Uh, but it's exciting and challenging. There are, of course, different scales of investigation. The data production and analy analysis uh, that some of us are doing can take a very long time. Um, the GIS specialists uh, are much faster. The palynologists are also a little bit faster. Uh, we also are dealing with cultural heritage management laws, meaning that, of course, some of us need to apply, for, you all know this, for uh, permits uh, to go uh, investigate uh, cultural um, remains, uh, whereas the, the colleagues in the natural sciences are more lucky and are allowed to, if they have you know, non-obvious cultural remains that they're uh, digging through, uh, can be a bit more uh, free with their uh, choice. So all of this uh, is also interesting and, and also needs explaining back and forth, but by the way. Uh, so anyway, so we have these six, um, <coughs> excuse me, six work packages. Uh, two are archaeology packages, uh, but very different. They overlap, but they're very different. Uh, they're sort of settlement uh, history focused uh, via analysis and assessment of farm boundary walls. Not going into all of this, uh, but uh, there was a lot of turf construction happening in Iceland uh, throughout the entire settlement period. Um, and you all know by now that there is a lot of uh, volcanic activity going on. So uh, we have uh, some really nice isochronic markers in, in, across the, uh, the, the landscapes and, and down into the prehistoric um, landscape covering. So uh, we have stripes basically in the soil. Um, it's very nice. Um, and based on those, we, we get initial ideas of which uh, period in time we might find ourselves in. And then the, the real specialists come and actually analyze the, the tephra layers for us. Um, so tephra chronology really, really works very well for us in Iceland. Um, this is the work package that I claimed I was going to uh, be in charge of. And most of it, uh, it works out quite well. Um, we are catching up on uh, the isotope project and the ADNA just because we just finished digging and actually finding the samples that we need to analyze, or some of our great colleagues. But basically what we are trying to do, Christine and I especially, is find uh, farmsteads and associated midden mounds or middens uh, that, are, um, that can be used to, to look a bit about the farm economy and also settlement history of potentially highland farms or highland shielding sites, um, ideally also tenant sites, so sort of, uh, those that are not so very high on the, on the social scale, and then also large, uh, large sites. Um, this is tricky, it's a good plan, but of course it takes a lot of uh, stabbing uh, the ground with uh, soil cores to uh, find uh, middens and then testing uh, the often very deep uh, deposits to see if there's actually materials that we can do anything with. You have, we have geomorphology, uh, we have history, uh, and also theory of settlement and social conflict. Uh, we have black death uh, research, which just uh, started properly with uh, us having a new master student. Um, and then we have uh, paleoecology, which is, of course, one of the, one of the um, disciplines that uh, environmental archaeology works very, very well together because we actually speak a lot of the same languages. Uh, but then we have uh, the geologists who are actually, you know, um, um, geology um, sort of scientists uh, who, who also uh, look into the um, past uh, weather patterns, the past uh, landslide uh, patterns, and also avalanche patterns and, and kind of try to figure out what sort of, uh, what sort of conditions might have been in place to uh, produce massive landslides uh, that actually covered a lot of the farms and killed quite a few people. And can we pick up 
on the uh, archaeological or the cultural uh, sort of remnants underneath. Um, they're trying to really uh, sort of go about it in a very systematic way. Um, Sven Brynjolfsson being uh, one of the guys who is working with uh, critical web patterns nowadays, and he is on Landslide and Avalanche Watch, so he's the one who goes out there and you know makes uh, makes um, or, or sets out the warnings if there is something going to happen, which happened a lot. Uh, we have uh, the paleoecologists who are sort of trying to figure out how to attack this uh, this question, like. How do we even uh, address these questions about uh, different farm sites, uh, sizes, changes in the in the hierarchy? What does that mean? What does that look like uh, in, in in the vegetation uh, from the past? Um, and is there a difference in land use and all of that? So Elizabeth has the Ella Austal color, uh, and she calls herself uh, has the task of uh, going, uh, wrapping her head around this, but Eitl is helping her a lot. And Eitl, on his, his end, is now working uh, towards an archaeology degree. So it's not enough that he is a professor in uh, paleoecology, but uh, he really is very interested in understanding the archaeology that he already knows so very well, even better. Um, so, El, uh, Austria is, is dealing with how, how to go about uh, at least addressing these questions. Uh, and so data analysis, of course, paleontological study, but also tephrochronology, and really finding uh, finding wet meadows, finding um, um, mere uh, that that have been wet for a long, long time and have actually trapped the pollens in the landscape is a challenge. Um, Luckily, uh, we have such wetland areas close to Startunga, the big farm that uh, Christian and I have been digging in, for a while the midden have been uh, digging in. Uh, so we are looking forward, which is here, uh, we are looking forward to some analysis of the pollen uh, in about a year's time, I think. And also Hauskot, the uh, this, uh, uh, upland uh, shielding site, with this really nice uh, ring-formed uh, site uh, uh, farm boundary uh, where uh, Christian and I and our colleagues who were in the field with us put so many soil cores in and uh, we can we can uh, at least uh, confirm that there is no obvious mittens there unfortunately it would have been really nice because this could have been a, a candidate for a, a if not a site uh, that is low in, in social hierarchy at least one that is uh, potentially not uh, used uh, for a very long time. So, so this timing of settlement and abandonment would have been a very nice uh, uh, addition, but it wasn't, wasn't to be. But uh, what they did find was uh, nice um, undisturbed uh, natural layers, if you like, uh, with uh, some nice undisturbed uh, tephra layers in them. That you don't see it necessarily, but this is a blue, bluish black layer. There is a blackish, grayish black layer. Uh, Ethel is, is not gonna uh, be happy if I just uh, analyze them without talking to him because uh, that they have to be, uh, he knows uh, what year they are. But potentially, if I'm not completely wrong, this is uh, 18th century and this is uh, 15th century, but this could also be uh, 1300 Tephra and also. 15th century Tefra, but he, he knows a lot more because he does the analysis. He does things such as this, uh, where you know there's a lot of um, chemical analysis happening and uh, uh, a lot of science, science that I don't necessarily, I understand, but uh, I can't get into because I won't explain it very well. But what he's really trying to do is figure out which, uh, which Tefra layers that we think are the basal layers to our uh, human activity that we find in our middens, for example, or in the farm boundary walls, actually are the ones that uh, we understand to be, for example, the ones that are uh, the 877 plus minus one, the 1300, the 1104. Uh, so we can actually do this uh, chronology of activity either via the, the pollen cores, he, he's worked on here, or the uh, 
the pepper layers that we find in the in the middens, and uh, they're almost as colorful as this, actually. Yeah. So Star Tunga is going to be one of those sites where we have the basal uh, layer uh, that we call the, the land taking, the lump non layer. So we, we have on this site, just to spoil the story, we have everything uh, from the entire uh, settlement history now. Uh, and we kind of knew this last year, but the story got a bit better this year. Um, now we're going to talk about livestock and landscape. So this is part of, this got a bit mixed up, but this is probably my fault because uh, didn't have a, a good chance to reorganize them properly. But anyway, so now we're coming to the Sioux archaeology and attached and associated uh, work package. And basically, Ingrid Mainland, uh, our great colleague from the University of Highlands and Islands, she, she has been uh, dealing with these questions for a long time, and she's part of our project. Uh, so the question is, livestock and landscape, and, and how do they go together, how can we place them, how can they help us, these animal bones, help us say something about how humans uh, use their uh, landscapes, uh, their pasture lands, and, and how do we even go about this? Um, what she has been doing a lot is dental microwear uh, and also isotope analysis, and she's been working quite a bit with our uh, colleague Philippa Asko from uh, the University of Glasgow, from Zurich, uh, the Scottish University Education and uh, Research Centre. And uh, so they've been doing quite a bit of studies uh, in Orkney, but also in, Niva, uh, in other sites in Iceland, uh, and sort of trying to figure out how one could even tell, uh, like, what are the signatures one could potentially pick up from these uh, isotopes, but also the the sheep um, dental uh, microware, so the, the, the traces left on the, uh, the surface of the tooth that's used to chew either brush uh, uh, shrubbery or, or different kinds of grasses, what kind of markers do they leave? So this gets really, really, really in-depth um, and um, you need to have a lot of uh, training to do this, so uh, we asked her to have a look at it. So. It is about establishing what kind of, what kind of uh, information we, we learn and what can this information do to us. So this is not uh, uh, only two different isotopes. This is very different isotopes and people really understanding what it is they're doing. This is also uh, really uh, sequentially uh, uh, sample or sequentially um, uh, Sort of yeah, cutting and, and sampling uh, the te the teeth that we know of uh, that are from animals of certain uh, time periods in their lives, and then also that we need to know which uh, time period chronologically they come from. So there is a lot of uh, sort of prep work we Christine and I have to do before we can actually hand over those samples. We're almost there, and then. Uh, Philippa and uh, Ingrid can do a bit of uh, magic. This is mostly Philippa's work uh, with uh, nitrogen and um, C13 uh, carbon uh, isotopes where they can uh, figure out uh, what, what kind of uh, different uh, grazing um, or enriched uh, grazing uh, uh, land uh, the animals might have come from and also uh, where in the, in the trophic uh, level they, they were. Uh, and I'm not going to go much deeper into this. Uh, they have written several uh, papers so you can look up on this. Um, and, but what they have also, together with this uh, uh, dental uh, microware, so this is the occlusal surface of a, a sheep tooth. Um, Ingrid especially was able to figure out uh, the, the sort of what, what kind of uh, groups of um, vegetation left which kind of marks. So that gets us started on, okay, where in, in this valley system or these valley systems might these animals have been? Uh, it's the easy, uh, easy sort of conclusion, but of course it's never that easy. Uh, first, we need to figure out what all of this looks like in our area. So a couple of years ago, uh, I had to uh, dissect um, the skulls 
of some uh, young sheep that we knew uh, the farmers provided that we knew had either been grazed in the lowlands or in the highlands. And she started looking a bit about what kind of uh, signatures she could pick up. Uh, and we have to continue with that. Um, and uh, Christine uh, and I, we, uh, we sent in a tree of our archaeological uh, teeth, if you like, uh, that, uh, or tooth uh, ropes that will hopefully uh, give us a bit of information in a couple of months. But uh, basically, <coughs> the suggestion <coughs> is that we can at least get an idea of the differences of, uh, of the patterns that we find, if we find any from the different uh, time periods, if we can or she can uh, see that there is winter grazing uh, typical patterns uh, versus summer grazing typical patterns, if the oxygen isotope especially uh, can pick up on uh, changes in uh, temperature and all of, all of that. Um, but also, what, uh, what uh, the C14 dates can tell us about our uh, stratigraphy. So all of this sounded really great, but extremely complicated until uh, we were uh, coming back, we were down here at the Starak Tunga, uh, where instead of having this fantastically uh, striped uh, trench uh, that you will see in a moment, uh, we had a still fantastically striped trench, but nothing is exciting. Uh, visually, however, uh, in terms of uh, bone preservation, we have uh, a thousand years of really well-preserved archaeofauna. So, from a, a midden where we spent, I think, the better part of six weeks stabbing and uh, looking for things, and you know, where none of us thought a few years back when Howell and I actually started uh, coring there that anything much was left because this was a huge farm mound or the midden, the garbage of a huge farm mound that had been in use for so long, that had been used by many different people, that had been um, sort of dug into to, to uh, make room either for, um, for structures and or had been dug into to use as fertilizer for the fields to improve the grasses. So finding intact uh, midden uh, layers that you then can use to uh, find an approximate chronology of site settlement use. Uh, and mind you, we don't know anything about the site until, uh, or not much, until the 14th century. Uh, we know that there was a church farm there once and bits and pieces, but we, don't, we didn't know that it was just inhabited all this time. Um, then we went to Hauskot, where, like I said, we weren't so very uh, successful, uh, but we still gathered a whole lot of information with those cores, so we, we can uh, extend the activity there a little bit back from what originally was uh, thought to be the case. So that, that will add to our story of what the, what the use of shielings was and how they can say anything about uh, uh, the farming uh, sort of... Um, organization and also the organization of the farmland itself. Uh, a one cool site uh, that uh, people who are living on uh, Christian Eliot's uh, old farm, remember this is the next, uh, I'm almost done, the next uh, valley site up to the north, uh, they always wanted us to come and see this and we said yes, but sorry Artme if you're hearing this, but um, you know, this was a very obvious site, and this this was a we didn't know the sort of status, but it, it was yet another big farm site, right? The thing is, nobody knew any like we didn't know anything when this site was uh, settled. What we knew was that the old farmhouse was pulled down uh, and and sort of mixed in with a lot of the old uh, the previous farmhouse, which was uh, destroyed in 1930s mixed in with like even older materials. So even finding an understart uh, sequence uh, of cultural layers it was a head scratcher. But then we found it. Uh, and we came across some uh, fantastically uh, preserved um, organic materials uh, and then uh, another set of uh, walls. Only the walls were much older. So uh, I still have to talk to Artney and also Eric, but we think that we have a settlement site uh, structures here as well. So that's nice news, but also a lot of samples 
oh yeah, I'm talking about samples, everything took a lot longer, which is always the case, right? The more samples you take, uh, the more lo the longer it takes, and then what you do with it, because it's expensive to analyze it. But uh, we were able to take uh, samples from here and also from uh, the other side in the south, Sartunga, for sedimentary um, DNA. That uh, some is directly going to members of sea change, and some we have to just figure out how to take the next step. But uh, this is kind of the first time we're doing any of this in this area, so it's, it's kind of exciting. We don't know what to expect from this, but uh, people are interested in, in, in looking at this. And uh, especially with sites, like Staratunga last year was fantastic in terms of chronology, but the bone preservation was just not so great. But since we took the uh, eDNA uh, samples, we might get an idea of what kind of uh, animal species we might be missing there. So we won't be able to say anything about farm economy, but at least we might say something about what was present absent. That's already more than we have now. And it is from a handful of dirt, if you like. Uh, that's nicely nested in between two uh, chronological markers or different layers. Yeah, OK, here we go, finally. So this is last year's amazing uh, profile where we had uh, seven, eight, nine hundred years of uh, activity. Uh, this is our um, prehistoric sequence. This is, uh, you can't see it here, but it's three layers of uh, the tephra uh, sequence connected to uh, 877 or the settlement uh, layer. And that uh, we really had cultural remains all the way up. Uh, <clears throat> this. Um, very trench here started probably in the 18th, 19th century, whereas the one that we have now uh, had the uh, debris of the Staratunga's former farmhouse uh, that was torn down in 1930s on top of it all. So that was a head scratch to get through last year. But then we could just almost take the modern lid off, if you like, and go all the way back down to this layer here. And even with good... Uh, uh, funnel, uh, funnel um, preservation. Uh, we, we also took bulk samples, so we're going to also do a lot of uh, well, flotation and, and a lot of other analysis. So Don Nune from Stavanger will probably see this again. Uh, here we have a whale bone that's uh, right on top of this sort of dark grayish, bluish layer, which is actually the uh, 1300, Hecla 1300 tephra layer. Uh, which is a great marker. Here is the Hecla level of four, the whitish grayish tephra layer, which gives us really nice uh, sort of uh, stop gaps, if you like. This is our fantastic uh, host from Staratunga, Line. She's a veterinarian, but uh, she always was interested in archaeology, and she's actually excavating the level of four layer in uh, the new uh, trench, if you like. You can see here bones sticking out. Uh, so this one, this one's our new favorite. Uh, but coming back to what, what is it that we can do with all of this information? Well, ideally we can combine uh, the changes in chronologi chronolo chronology of the, the, the farm demarcations, the maybe extension or um, divvying up of these uh, farmlands, grazing areas, and connect them up with uh, what we see uh, in the palynology uh, or in the paleoecology, but also in the zooarchaeology, and, and tie a bit uh, of, of the patterns together, ideally. But really what we're uh, figuring out is uh, yeah, uh, better questions that we can actually ask the materials. So who knows how much we will actually be able to answer what it was we set out, but uh, those things that we will actually be able to address we can uh, at least stand on and make a, for us archaeologists, very daring, uh, you know, interpretation where we actually venture into a bit of a, you know, answer or a statement, uh, because we all know we're not so very, not so very brave there. And uh, yes, mm -hmm. this is just all of them and all of us, not everybody yet, but uh, yeah, people who like to play and, uh, are great people. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your patience. I think. Okay. 
thank you. Ramona. It was a fascinating talk. <laughs> no, no, it was really such a big project. Um, but it really shows how much you can do when you unite all the people together with their different uh, disciplines. I think it's a perfect example of that. Um, I really like the wear on the um, sheep teeth. I think it was uh, quite, quite nice to, to look at. Um, and amazing tephra layers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very much. Yes, uh, I'd like to also say uh, we're lucky if we get funded for this, right? But uh, the potential of these things are great. So I'm looking at this. Uh, this is a fantastic study, but hopefully it can serve also as a pilot study to other applications where we can at least demonstrate that we can very much contribute to some of the questions, uh, you know, that, that humans are still interested in. Are there any questions from the audience? I could just say that we are hoping to put together a session at the EAAs next year, and uh, we have to see if we can. But uh, the next uh, step is analysis, uh, at least of, of some of the data, and then put it all together. Uh, into a, into a publication, so then you will actually hear from the expert what it is they were doing. You know? and we will try to come together and do some synthesis also, so that's why it would be very nice if we manage to do this session, so we can uh, sort of all meet up and then try to um, meet somewhere in, in a place in the middle where we all step outside of our comfort zone and try to sort of play around a little bit of, ooh, what, but what does this mean and how can we address all of this from our end, and where do we land in the middle? I don't know where we're going to get, but we're going to have to have this uh, sort of exchange and uh, discourse, even amongst ourselves. And, and we're going to, of course, uh, invite others in as well, if it happens. <laughs> it's, it's not just us, but uh, we need to really, uh, in, in order to, I think that's the, the, the real big challenge of these interdisciplinary projects is to be able to, to do the synthesis. I mean, independently, all of this will be really, really interesting, but are we gonna be able to, to, to put out uh, some combined uh, statement? That would be interesting. Yeah, yeah that's the diff uh, difficult part when it's so big to have mm -hmm. everyone yeah, work in one publication. It's, um, yeah, but it's in a way the final product uh, of all this work, so. Yeah, the, the baby coming. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone has a question or comment? So I guess we have both. Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, thank you very much for that. I wondered if you could expand on what exactly you're looking for to try and mark the social stratification that you're looking for in this site, right? Like what, what artifacts would prove those to you? That is an excellent question. Uh, the, the artifacts, um, since we are dealing with, you know, the middens are basically, at least very often, the results of cleaning up the household. So it's kind of a secondary deposit. Uh, so for that kind of uh, analysis, it would probably be better to have the, the, the structural remains themselves. So we find the whatever, or, the, or burials, which we are lacking, but we don't have the money or energy for for it right now, that's the next step, hopefully. Uh, so we're not focusing so very much on artifacts per se, but we are focusing more on uh, this being a very rural area, on the, the ownership via pasturages uh, and uh, tenant farms and shearlings, uh, how uh, the land might have been divided up. So this is a lot about livestock and, and also the, the area owned by certain uh, farms. So this is very much, uh, it, I don't think, uh, and I'm going to have to have an argument with some people <laughs> in, in my own, or, or we're going to have to have a discussion uh, about this. I'm not sure we can make absolute statements unless we actually have uh, the historical uh, data, you know, that tells us something. What we can uh, do is, uh, figure out if we can find out what it means uh, on our end, uh, what uh, social stratification, if we can pick it up or not. And, you know, it, it, there's a larger answer to it all, uh, but uh, we have to be very careful, at least uh, those of us who do paleoecology and, and uh, uh, you know, 
and also solar for marine archaeology. We have to be careful that we, we uh, know that we're using um, proxy data, right? If we do end up finding, like, uh, for example, uh, at, at a little uh, sh uh, site, little farm site, early farm site that Paul and I worked on uh, some years ago, if, if we find indicators for sort of, uh, that you would usually expect that on trade sites, like we found the arms of a folding scale, for example, that's when, you know, we can start a little bit about this. Or for us, so archaeologists, we find a certain pattern in the archaeofauna, but the artifact, Iceland is difficult in terms of artifacts. Uh, Norway, much better. Uh, we have everything here. Uh, but, uh, and traditionally it was here we have a lot of the, the fantastic shinies, uh, but not so much the organic material. So it's a very good question. And, and based on artifacts, I don't know if we can answer it from this project. Like it would have to be a different focus, you know. If you had, um, if you had uh, um, a yeah, pre-medieval uh, or pre-Christian uh, graveyard, and we're able to excavate all of these graves, and then uh, we're able to, to you know, uh, find, if they hadn't been robbed, if you were able to find those uh, shinies, you might have a better uh, stab at it. Or if you have a really large, um, like a long haul from the Viking Age. Viking Age is good because uh, once it turned Christian, it becomes a lot more, uh, you know, um, it becomes more complicated than that even. Uh, but it is based on uh, artifacts, it's really hard. Uh, of course, these, some of these sites are huge, you know, you have huge farm mounds, so we also need to just look at the environment around it, but also uh, how much accumulation of uh, cultural material is we're looking at. So, I, sorry, this was a very expansive <laughs> answer. <laughs> But uh, I, I don't think we can do it based on artifacts. But if we get indicators, that's very interesting. And I think what would be really interesting is to find artifacts that we don't expect there, that ties us back to the more central area and then also to Europe, per se. Right? So that's something we're hoping for still. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I was wondering more of a methodological question if you can expand a little bit about the idea of animal biographies that you mentioned, I think towards the end of the oh, presentation, that uh, if that is something uh, somewhere there. That's Ingrid, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if, I don't know if there is any, any kind of a conceptualization about what it means it looks like uh, the more we, we have and develop uh, technology that allow us to actually trace uh, uh, the lives of uh, animals, the more we use it, but, but to some extent as a, as a sort of means for something else uh, that goes beyond or, or is totally separated from actual animal biographies, more about social orders or environmental transformations. So I was wondering if there's something else that, that puts together all that, which is our, our usual concerns, with an actual animal biography. I don't know how to say it in a different way, but it's exactly that. It's, it's an excellent question, and uh, um, all I can tell you, you probably know this, but all I can tell you during uh, different life stages in, in all of us, you know, who have uh, teeth, uh, um, we take up uh, different... Um, like teeth usually take up uh, isotopes and, and then they don't uh, change. So they, they're sort of a, a, I know you know this, but a, they're sort of a repository. And so by knowing uh, how old the animal was and which uh, tooth we uh, use, we have an idea of where the young ins were kept, right? Or where the uh, old ones were kept. So we get a bit of an idea of maybe there was a difference in positioning them. This is a lot about pastoralism. And uh, I mean, Iceland doesn't have uh, really high mountains, but in other areas where you have much more, uh, you know, more than three, four hundred meters difference between the lowland and the highland, you can really go into uh, with oxygen, uh, with strontium. Uh, yeah, if if you have good mark, it's all really complex. Uh, and actually, the isotope specialists will probably tell you, ah, uh, it's even more complex. But but it is about um, sort of figuring out. If you have enough uh, of these animal uh, remains left, 
what might have happened with them, where might they have been kept, and potentially even at which time in their life. And based on that, when we then go back, then we have to come back to often uh, the more historical uh, and even the more recent uh, examples uh, where we understand how animals are being uh, herded around. And, and I do think it has something to do with um, land ownership, with uh, who gets to be you know, the, the landowner and who is working for the landowners, things like that. And then uh, we're talking about social inequality and, and sort of just the gist of it, which is again very, very simplistic, by sort of ascertaining what happened before in the Black Death and which of the large farms uh, might have been uh, occupied before and after, and which of the small areas uh, popped up or the, the sort of dependent farms popped up. We can at least have an idea of uh, there was a magnet farmer and had uh, subsidiaries that had feed to feed back and then had to also feed into the uh, church government as well, uh, or into the religious government. I'm, I'm very bad with uh, medieval terminology. But uh, so, so there was, uh, and actually Arne Daniel has written about this, there was quite a lot of uh, medieval um, feudalism going on. And there's also the question, was there really an a egalitarian uh, society that landed in Iceland? And what does that look like? So, so a lot of the things is also about we need to question what we learn uh, based on what we find. So, but taking it further, I think it's a very good question, but I think we need to come back to that. Um, yeah. But uh, this pastoralism uh, sort of assessment is done in many different places in the world. So, so that could be a, a sort of you know connection point between us doing our respective case studies, meeting up and then trying to sort our heads around making a larger you know, sort of statement. Um, one person, his name is Eugene Costello, he's, he's been doing a lot of more uh, historical um, pastoralism uh, research in Ireland. Uh, it's probably interesting to look him up because he might have pushed it. He might have been able to push it a little bit further because he had so much more historical data. And there's a lot going on in, in Spain as well, and of course also in South America because you have this extreme uh, height differences there. So we have uh, Victor and then we have Finn. Yeah, thank you. It was a really interesting talk, I think. And um, but and I was wondering with you know with all these different strands of uh, Paleo environmental data and also you know the natural environment with you know, landslides that you mentioned, volcanic eruptions and so forth. Um, I was wondering if there's any way where you could draw on all that data to make any sort of inferences on the general sort of demographic development as well within these valleys. I mean, surely that could also be one entryway into this idea about egalitarian to complex uh, societies and so forth. Do you have any sort of ideas if that could be woven into? Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, that was an excellent question. Uh, it's just not the best question to ask me. Uh, if you had uh, if you had asked uh, Arne Daniel, he is all about all of this and, and numbers and all of that. Of course, we know population numbers uh, is one thing, but you know he has done, he's an uh, economic uh, historian uh, and also environmental historian, so he's looked at he looks a lot about numbers and data, so there are people who deal with that. So once we filter all of this in, I think uh, we will have a better, collectively a better uh, answer, but it, it has to be him and uh, Axel who, who sussed this out. And maybe Aileen, uh, because it, it, it again has to do with what size is a traditional farm set, right? And uh, what size might have been the uh, dependencies? Uh, how many people might have been on the shillings? How does that all interact? So we have to figure that out first. Yeah. But it's really great question. And also, we have um, uh, uh, they, they have um, historical data on how many people died, uh, for example, in, in the early 14th century, where, where this valley system just got inundated by uh, landslides. And actually, um, this, this region is called Skriduhreppur which means uh, a district of uh, landslides. 
uh, on the, so, so this has impacted everything. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe a very basic question because I don't know much about Iceland and archaeology at all. Um, but I was wondering uh, when you were talking about livestock movement and you know, the whole pasteurization um, idea, is there uh, some sort of are there some sort of um, demarcations for grazing grounds and stuff like that? Do you have maybe stone heaps or something in that uh, regards? Because I know, for example, from from uh, Jordan, from the desert, that you have. And you can like follow or try to follow movement of herds uh, by these kinds of mark uh, markers. So I was just wondering whether stuff like that exists in Iceland. Excellent question. And uh, the, some of the colleagues are working on this, uh, where you have sort of the modeling of uh, least cost, uh, uh, what you call it, pathway and all of that. Uh, so and and there are some markers, not everywhere. And also the, the problem with Iceland is that. The, the vegetation cover has changed so very much, right? And uh, there is so much erosion going on because this already being very, very fragile land coverage, uh, once you pull out the, the trees, and it wasn't as drastic as it had been told previously, but you, you destabilize uh, the, the, the slopes uh, very easily. And now you're also uh, doing a number on the, the snow uh, coverage. So it has to do again with temperature change and all. But, uh, but by and large, there are uh, models that can be done, and uh, somebody who has worked on this is Oskar Aldret, uh, and also Christian Metzen, who is doing a lot of work in Greek, well, he's based in Greenland now, but uh, there, uh, and also Andy Casely uh, previously. So there are people you can look up if you're interested in this. And yes, we need to, for a really big picture uh, synthesis, which has to be the second book. <laughs> uh, we need to put all of this uh, in there as well. Thank you. The, the, the one thing that I can say is, uh, this being Iceland, we're all being colleagues and, and friends, of course, this bond, uh, or this project here, uh, sort of birthed uh, another uh, directly connected project is called, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's about shillings and shilling sites. And there is loads of that going on there. So I think we just need to see what they come up. They had their first season this spring, I believe. Or, or the second season, sorry. I forget who I work with in this project and who in the other project, but, but there will be uh, quite a bit of data coming out. Thank you. Uh, there's a question. Thank you again, uh, Ramona, for this uh, talk. Okay. Thank you for the excellent question. I hope I did them uh, justice. I, so the, here you see, I can only answer for myself, right? And, and even though I think this is a fantastic project, the, the specialists are in the other work packages. But, uh, they, they will give me an earful if I said something more. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, next yes. seminar is the Halloween one on the 27th, where we'll have a three uh, spooky speakers at uh, a later time than usual, uh, starting at 5. And uh, before that, we actually have a special event together with the Norwegian Institute in Athens, which is on the 17th. Uh, of October, so it's a Tuesday at 2, there's a book launch, um, which is a book that results from a conference that they held uh, that is called Vikings in the Mediterranean. So uh, Jaco uh, will talk about the, the book because it was his idea and you can yeah, hear a little bit about uh, that because it's the first time ever there is a conference dedicated specifically to Vikings in the Mediterranean. Um, thank you for coming, and I guess we are going for beer for the people. But yeah, so uh, we will go to a conference.